Hello and welcome to the Coon Hunting University podcast. This is your host, Tyler Duncan. And like always, class is in session. you just heard was grand night champion grand show champion house's lipper we're gonna hear from the man that recorded that audio and also raised lipper as a puppy and promote him as a stud dog that man's name mr tom hopkins mr tom had an extremely successful coon hunting career we'll be talking about old lipper and the story behind him some of his puppies also what it was like to promote a stud dog such as lipper we're gonna get mr tom on the line he's joining us virtually but before we do that I'd like to say something that I forgot to ask Mr. Tom, but we talked about it after this. So that audio that you heard was captured on a cheap cassette tape, and it died before they actually got to the tree. So, I mean, you can tell that's why they're walking in the recording. I asked Mr. Tom, so, you know, I mean, I can get that audio off of YouTube, but if you have the MP3 file, it'd be great. He said, I still got the cassette tape that it went on. So he still has the original cassette tape of that recording. That's pretty cool. Figured I'd like to add that. And also, this will be a two-parter due to the length of it, but it'll be worth it. So, without further ado, Mr. Tom Hop, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, Mr. Tom, how's it going, man? Going good, Tyler. I appreciate you having me on your podcast today. It's a it's an honor and a privilege to be here to take a walk down memory lane about old Lipper. Yes, sir. Well, it is an honor and a privilege for me to be conducting this interview. I promise you that. And you might not know my name, but I sure knew yours. And I, I like old Lipper's bloodline still to this day. So I'm a fan and it's an honor to have you on here. If you would, please well, tell you. the folks at home a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, I was born in Marshall, Texas in, in 1950. Uh, began coon hunting with my dad back in 1955. Dad was a, he was a dedicated coon hunter. He, he loved to hunt and he would hunt five or six nights a week. Even though we had a little country general store that he worked in 12 hours a day, he'd still hunt five or six nights a week. And he was a good hunter and a good dog trader. I learned a lot from him. Uh, I'd go with him every time he'd let me go, which was pretty often. I learned to drink that black coffee and wade the sloughs and walk the logs, climb the trees and punch out coons. But uh, all the things that the kid learns, one of Dad's best hunting buddies was Kurt Harless. He had moved to Marshall with T&P Railroad from Alabama, and he was familiar with competition hunting. He knew uh, Joe House and uh, James Merchant and those guys, uh, so he was familiar with it. But my dad was not. He was just a country boy coon hunter. But anyway... Dad had a good blue tick female, and Kurt had a, a dead gum good black and tan male, and they made a cross, and my dad raised a pup out of that called Hammer. That's the dog that I cut my teeth on and hunted with for several years. He was an awful good dog and, and taught me a lot about coon hunting. And Dad taught me a lot about tell what a dog was doing by listening to him, you know, whether he was in a thicket or in water and what kind of mouth he was giving in those situations, and uh, I learned an awful lot there. Fast forward a little bit, a few years later, they got into walker dogs, and Dad bought a, a grade walker dog named Wheeler, and he was a master at running a track and drifting a track, could really get some coons treed, so I got Kurt to take me, Kurt and Ralph Williams, to take me to my first competition hunt when I was about 12 years old. I took old Wheeler and won my first trophy. We placed third, and uh, I was just hooked on it after that. 
After that, I, I began receiving the American Cooner and the Full Cry magazines, and man, I'd read them cover to cover. I was a fan of reading old Timothy Ball's ads. I called Timothy since he was just up in Oklahoma, not too far from me, and uh, went up there and hunted with Timothy a few times, and hunted with old Hickory Nut Harry. And I bought a pup from Tim that was out of Norman's Coon Stopper and Ball's Candy, which were both pretty well-known dogs. I named him Cyanide, called him Cy, but he was a natural track and tree dog, and I was hunting him pretty hard, and uh, A.W. Norman that owned Coon Stopper called me, and he said, I heard you've got a good young dog out of Coon Stopper, and I said, well, I do. He said, well, would you sell him? I said, I, I would for the right price, which this was back in the 70s, early 70s probably. I told him I'd take $1,500, and I thought I was pricing him high. He asked me if I would come up and hunt with him, so I took him up there, and old Cy a couple of coons, pretty short order. Mr. Norman said, that's enough, I'll take him. He bought him. Anyway, I, I was always starstruck with the ads on houses, Chief. I always thought that, man, if I could have a dog that looked as good as old Chief and was that famous, I'd be satisfied. Anyway, a friend of mine down in Carthage, Texas, Buddy Harris, he had an old housebred female, but he had ordered a uh, pup from Joe House out of House's Clint and House's Queen Lou. was an older brother to Lipper, actually, same cross. He named him Clint's Kentucky Case, and he had him started, but he wasn't able to hunt due to his workload very much, so uh, we made a deal to partner that dog, and I would take and train him and, and put him in some hunts. Old Casey made a night champion pretty quick. Joe House called me, and I thought, man, Joe House called me. He said, I heard you got a good dog out of old Clint. I said, well, I do. I do have one. He said, well, I want to come down and go hunting with him. I thought, man, Joe House is going to come go hunting with me. So sure enough, he came down. Back then, we hunted on mules a lot. A good friend, Mr. Ralph Williams, had an outstanding place to hunt down in Sabine River Bottom. So Joe got there, and I loaded up a couple of mules and loaded up Casey, and we went to the river bottom. Casey treed, uh, I don't remember whether it's two or three coons that night, but he looked pretty good. Joe said, I'd like to buy that dog. I said, well, my half is not for sale. I said, that's a prettiest dog, got a good mouth, and a dog I've been looking for. I said, you might can buy Mr. Buddy's half. So next morning, he called Buddy Harris, and he bought his half of him for $3,000, I believe it was. So we were partners. I was partners with Joe House, and I thought, man, that's a deal. And he pulled a pup out of his box, best-looking pup I believe I'd ever seen. He said, I brought this pup down here. He said, I've heard about how hard you hunt. He said, I'd like to partner this pup with you if he makes anything. He said, take and hunt him. If he makes anything, we'll be partners. And he said, if he don't, shoot him. That was old Lipper. That's how I come about getting him. From that point, I, I got to know Lipper there for a few days, kind of bonded with him a little bit, and I took him down to the woods and took him down to Haggerty Creek, cut him down at a logging road. I unsnapped him, and he left like a bullet down that old grown-up logging road. He went about 50 or 75 yards and just jumped straight up in the air and just screamed. I thought he'd run into a fence or something. He hit the ground and peeled off down through there, just screaming and bellering. A couple hundred yards, he just started just screaming like he's in a trap. I thought, man, that dog's hurt. I went down there, and he had a coon. I said, boy, this is probably the dog I've been looking for all my life. A few days went by, and I called Joe. I said, Joe, I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you my half of that Casey dog, if you'll give me control of this dog, we'll still be partners, but he won't ever leave my house. He said, well, I'll do that. So we did. And that's where I started with old Lipper. From there, you know, I put him in a couple of little hunts and bench shows, and I, I won a little hunt with him. But actually, the first son I, I won with him, a friend of mine and I went up to Hamburg, Arkansas, and uh, entered a hunt. There were probably 60 dogs there, and it was you know, quite a few people, and it was Lipper's first hunt. We drew out. Some guys came over to me and said, man, he said, you drew out with Troy Reese. I said, okay. He said, man, he's a bully. He's a big bully. So I just let it roll off. We went on to the woods, and uh, we cut the dogs loose. Lipper had first strike, good hot track. Down through there they went and got treed. We walked in there where there's a red bone. It was way off the tree that came running in there after we got there. We scored the coons and looked at the coon, 
And I asked the judge, I said, did you minus that red dog? And he pulled me off to the side and said, man, that's Troy Reese's dog. We can't minus him. I said, I said, heck, he was off the tree. Well, Troy walked up to me. And he said, little, little man, he said, uh, you handle that spotted dog and I'll handle this red one. And I said, well, he was off the tree. He said, little man, I'll break your back. And I said, well, you might do that, but you're not going to cheat me. So we went on, Judge Minus. We went on. They were running a pretty good score. It was kind of tense, you know, through the whole hunt. But we got back to the clubhouse, got out of the truck, and old Troy came over to me and put his arm around me. He said, Tom, said, you got one hell of a dog. He said, I want to buy your breakfast. And we went in the clubhouse, and he bought my breakfast and told everybody in there what a, what a good dog Lippert was. That was a, a memory that I'll never forget. After that, I entered Lippert in a three or four bench shows and won them and, and a couple of low hunts. Anyway, I, I still had his puppy papers. And back in those days, Joe House's wife, Dorothy, did all the paperwork, and they had raised so many puppies over the years that she had run out of names. So what she did on this litter was she named them Flipper, Dipper, Zipper, Lipper on all the puppy papers. And the papers I got had House's Lipper on them. So when I got ready to send the papers in to get my name put on them and, and get his name changed, I was going to change it to Clipper. But when I sent him in, UKC would not let me change that name because he was already a champion. So I was stuck with House's Lipper. And I thought, man, if this dog becomes anything famous or anything, I said, you know, you could name a dog anything and, and people get used to it. And they did. Lipper went on to win several hunts after that, the Texas State Champions Hunt and Show and Louisiana State Champion Hunt and Show, and Arkansas State Hunt and Show, and many others too numerous to mention, but I guess the most notable win was when we won the PCA National Championship in 1983. He was a two-year-old. There were 5,000 dogs entered in that hunt from the ground level, you know, started out local level, then you went to state and then regional, work your way up to the final hunt, which was in Chickasaw State Park in Tennessee. Man, that was a thrill to win. I got to drive that new truck back to Marshall, Texas, and drove it up in front of Dad's old car lot there. And I thought, well, I, I guess I've done what I set out to do. I wanted my dad to be proud of me, and I said, he ought to be proud of me now. And, and he was. That's kind of story on the hunting of Lippers. So, Mr. Tom, that truck that you and Lipper won, was that the same truck that I see pictures of you and him posed in front of with the placard yeah. on the side? Yeah, that Ford Ranger and that placard that came in a deal in a dog box. And I think it was $3,000 cash and a cup, a winner's cup. Joe House got the cup. I brought the rest of it to Texas. Yeah, you were sure rocking that 80s look and them pictures, man. <laughs> yeah, I can do a pro. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So let's circle back. What kind of dog was Hickory Nut Harry? You said you hunted with him. That's a pretty famous dog, too. A, I hunted with him a couple of times, uh, and he treats the coons. Timothy was real protective of him uh, around a tree, especially. I'll tell you, he was a little bit out here. He didn't want another dog around him much. He was a small dog, one of those bandy rooster type dogs strutted around all the time. But like I say, he was a little touchy. I saw him carry a couple of coons. Early on in your life, Handling in competition, you just kind of had a knack for it, almost? Well, that, and I learned a lot from a lot of people, you know, that tell me things. But, yeah, the main thing about calling your dog is knowing your dog. And that's one thing that, you know, back in the day, we didn't look at our garments all the time, didn't have a garment, didn't have a track and collar. You know, it was just listen to them and know what they're doing. So, I mean, you can tell if that dog's hitting a tree right or if he's if where that coon might have tapped or or whatever, and whether or not the tree. Lipper was pretty easy to call. Generally, when he located, it was over. But, yeah, you learn a lot about calling a dog or when not to call one. I guess I mostly learn by trial and error. So how competitive would Lipper be versus dogs of today? You know, I called Johnny McClanahan this morning. I was going to ask him something because I had a question about which young dog it was that I traded to him to get house's lawyer back from him and uh, he couldn't remember the dog's name either so we're both not too good at memory but but we talked about us how competitive would lipper be versus the dogs of the day and johnny's response was man he would destroy a cast today 
I feel the same way. He was a powerful dog. He was crack that jaw as soon as he smelled the coon. Had no loose mouth now, but he would, as soon as he smelled the coon, he was struck, and he would try to get by himself. And Lippert's day, most dogs packed, and Lippert would do his best and scatter a cast of dogs all over the woods and then slip over to the side and tree one. He was, he was a master at that. He was loaded with more than he needed of everything. He was a strike dog. He was a, the best track dog that I've ever seen and an awesome tree dog. I mean, when he treated me, he was there. The dogs that pull up short these days are the dog with a, that don't have a lot of mouth. Back in the day, I'd have Lippard be treated in there and, and a cast would ask the judge if they could back up so that they could hear their dog and we'd back up and then they said, no, we need to get closer. We still can't hear. Them. And so it, it was just hard to hear other dogs treat with old Lippard when he was treated. So that was an advantage as well. Other people didn't know whether to call their dogs or not. But yeah, and today's dogs, that a lot of them, you know, pull up short. I mean, that wasn't even something I thought about, because when he treed, you'd either have a, a legitimate den tree, you'd be looking at a coon. So he was kind of almost ahead of his time as far as wanting to be by himself, right? Yeah, yeah. When you'd unsnap him with three other dogs... He'd leave out of there so fast, they'd be just squealing and yipping behind him, trying to keep up with him. And he'd scatter them all over the woods, and in a minute, you might hear him behind you strike a track and get it treed before they could get to him. That's pretty cool to hear about. I love to hear about the old stories and everything and all the old dogs that we all read about, you know, mm -hmm. and have read about our whole lives. What age did you first breed Lipper? I know it was young, but what age was it? He was 11 months old, between 11 months old and a year old, just short of a year old when I bred him the first time. Back when I had Casey, my brother-in-law, which hunted with me a lot, we ordered a female each from Mike Dahoney out of Tree Picking Chief and Dahoney's Fancy. I never was much of a guy to, to hunt females, so I didn't think much of her, but I had her when I got lived her, and I'd never hunted her. When I was working there in the store, there was an old black gentleman, a good friend of mine, Willie Moore, he would come down and ask me to if he could go coot hunting with me. He didn't have a car, didn't drive. And I would go get Willie and, and take him hunting with me every once in a while. One night I picked him up and I decided I'd take this pup I got from Dahoney. I called her Lucille because she was redheaded. He really loved that little old female and uh, she didn't do much that night. Lipper treated a few coons, but she didn't do much. And uh, he said, would you sell me that dog? And I wasn't much of a female guy and I knew he didn't have much money. I said, yeah, Willie, I'll sell her to you for $35. And the next morning, he came down to the store with his $35 and put a hay string around her neck and led her home. I picked him up and went hunting with him a few more times. Well, she started running and treeing and looking dead gum good. And I said, Willie, would you sell that female back to me? He said, I like her. And I said, yeah. I said, if you give me 35 for her, I'll give you $50 back for her. And he sold her back to me for $50. And she was coming in heat, so I bred Lipper to her when, like I say, when Lipper was a little less than a year old. Lucille went on to make a heck of a female. The other one made a grand night. That other female, uh, Cedar Creek Cindy, was a dual grand, and she produced a world champion female uh, named Sally. Sally won the world hunt, and she was out of Lipper in Cedar Creek Cindy. I bred Lipper to Lucille. And had a litter of puppies, and out of that litter of puppies came House's lawyer, Grand Night Champion, and Dual Grand Champion, Camp's Midnight Magnum. He was the first dog that made Dual Grand out of Lipper, and he died of his leukemia at about two years old. And then Grand Night Champion, uh, Randy Pralix, Jolene, and Grand Night Champion, House's Hunter, Night Champion, House's Sounder, and Night Champion, Alabama Bali. They were all out of Lippert's very first litter. That was a heck of a cross. So you just named off all these great dogs that were in that litter. Was there another litter that you know of off of Lipper that was that well-rounded? I don't know. That one that, that Cash was out of that was uh, out of McKissick Creek Tabitha, I think there were several good ones came out of that, but I wasn't as, in as close a contact with those. They were up in Oklahoma or wherever, and... and that was an astounding litter. That's when I knew Lipper would reproduce. So being that you knew he was going to reproduce, you know, of course, legend goes, 
Flipper was only the second coon dog to ever be collected. What gave you the vision to even have him collect it, being at that time the registry did not even recognize it? Well, the man that I mentioned that had Froelich Jolene was Dr. Randy Froelich. He was one of the pioneer veterinarians of collecting canine semen. And he was a good friend of mine and had a dog out of Lipper. And after Lipper won that national championship, Randy begged me, he said, let me collect that dog. And I first didn't think much of it, and I mentioned it to Joe, and Joe House said, oh, that won't work. You can't freeze dog semen. And uh, anyway, Randy just begged me. He said, if you'll let me collect him, he said, it won't cost anything, and I'll store it as long as I own this facility. I'll store it for free for you if you just let me collect him. So I went down there on a Sunday afternoon. Randy and I collected a lipper one time. Got four vials of semen. Uh, the only dog that was collected before that was Spring Creek Rock. And Rock never was DNA'd, so it was kind of a, you know, an honor system as to whether that semen was from Rock or not. But there was some Rock semen that Dwayne Clark, those guys had. I mean, and it's so impressive that it was done so young. He was young, and you know, that semen, when I thought it out 30 some odd years later, was some of the best semen that, the, that Dr. Kent Law had ever seen. It was, it was very good because Lipper is young. Of course, I was breeding Lipper four or five times a week, so I didn't know how good it would be. Yeah, I mean, I guess most people, when they get a dog collected, you don't get them collected till they're seven, eight years old. Yeah. So, I mean. Yeah, he was, he was two coming. He might have been three. He was right. He was closer to two than he was to three. Yeah, that was good stuff there. And like you say, they didn't know whether the registry would recognize it or whether a female would even get pregnant with it. Do you know what year the registry did start recognizing it? It wasn't too awfully long after that. I'm really not sure because I wasn't planning on using mine anytime soon. I guess we could probably ask Mr. Steve Fielder. He'd probably know, huh? I bet he would. You mentioned some really nice pups off of Lipper. What's the nicest pup or pups you ever hunted off of Lipper and why? I had three awfully good dogs that went on to make a big mark in the coon hunting world that were for Lipper. The, the first one was House's Lawyer. Lawyer was an awesome dog. Johnny McClanahan got him when he was a puppy, and I heard him tree one night. I took a good young dog that I had over to Johnny's, and we hunted together. And Johnny liked the looks of the pup I had, and I hit him up. I said, I'll trade you this pup for old Lawyer and give you some money difference. I can't remember what it was, but... Anyway, I kept on working on him that night, and, and we traded dogs, and I got Lawyer back. I couldn't believe I got him back. Johnny didn't care for him that much on account of he uh, was a little bit tight on the track at that time. He didn't open a lot on the track. When he did, he sounded like a coyote. Boy, when he treed, the whole world changed. You couldn't hear yourself think. He was just an awesome, awesome tree dog and a gritty. He was a hard-going dog. So I got him back from Johnny. I'd have to say Lawyer was the loudest tree dog that I ever owned. I made a night champion out of Lawyer in nine days. He won, uh, I think, three firsts and a second, two weekends in a row, made him a night champion from never being put in a hunt. And it didn't take me long to grant him out after that either. The Lawyer dog is the reason I was able to own all of Lipper. Joe called me one day and said, uh, Tom said, we're going to have to settle up this partnership on old Lipper if you're going to keep him down there in Texas. And I said, well, he's staying here. He said, either you buy my half or I'll buy your half. He said, I'll take 10000 for my half. I said, well, Joe, you know I don't have $10,000. And uh, he said, well, what about that lawyer dog you got? I've been hearing about him. I said, yeah, he's a real deal. And he said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, you give me that lawyer dog and you can have my half a lipper. And so that transaction happened. As, as much as I hated to see lawyer go, it was a good deal for Joe and a good deal for me. Joe took him up there and bred him some good females. And if he hadn't got killed as young as he did, Joe said he would have been the best stud dog he ever owned. And he did put out some awful good dogs in the short period of time that Joe bred him. You were talking about Lawyer. You said he was a loud tree dog. Was he a ball mile tree dog or a chop mile? Yeah, I guess you'd have to call it a ball. It was a constant roar. He never closed his mouth and the sound never quit coming out. I don't see how he could breathe and do that at the same time. He like scared Timothy Ball to death. One night when I drew out with Timothy up at a hunt in Oklahoma, and they were treated in a switch cane thicket, and uh, we broke through into the to the tree, and Lawyer had that head back to screaming, and Timothy fell backwards and said, that dog's trying to bite me. And I said, no, 
That's just the way he trees, Tim. He was awesome. It's hard to describe what he sounded like. It was just a constant roar. Hey, y'all. That was a great first part of our interviews with Mr. Tom Hopkins. I do thank him for his time, and y'all be looking for part two. Y'all heard me testing Mr. Steve Felder in there. I hope I get an answer from that. Also, I'd like to note, Mr. Steve actually wrote an article on Tom Hopkins and Lipper, which will be coming out in the September edition of American Cooner. So go pick up a copy and read it. I'm sure it's going to be a great story. Mr. Steve's a great writer. He also read a part of that story on their podcast, Nightlife Nation. If you hadn't checked them out, which I'm sure you have, but I know at least a few of my listeners don't listen to any other podcast, so go over there and check them out. You won't regret it. Those guys make some great content, and they're, they're awesome guys. They really are. They've helped me out a ton. And find us on Facebook, at Coon Hunting You. And also, please go on Apple Podcasts, give us a rating and review. It really helps us out. Any hound hunting podcast, I encourage you to go to any hound hunting podcast and to give it a rating and a review. Because what that does is it manipulates the algorithm to where it'll show that that podcast in more searches and it'll recommend that podcast to more people. So with that being said, the more people that podcast is recommended to, the better chance it has of reaching somebody who is not in the coon hunting sport. And they click on it and they say, hey man, wow, that sounds pretty cool. You know, I want to try that out. There they are. They're trying it out. You know, so I mean, the more the more people we can get this message out to, the better chance we have of growing the sport. That's what it's all about. Until next time, y'all have a wonderful day.